Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk. So first, an introduction. I'm Ricardo Cruz. Cruz. Uh, everybody just call, can call me, you can call me Ricky. Everybody calls me Ricky. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat six years and a half. I'm a member of the product acquisition team of Ansible. We're responsible for building, delivering uh, the various components of the Ansible automation platform. And uh, we're also involved into uh, some other offerings in cloud and, and whatnot. And we're also responsible for the installers and the operators for Ansible. Previously to that, uh, previous company, HP, I was working um, heavily in OpenStack. I was part of the um, infra, infra team, both upstream and downstream. Then I joined uh, Red Hat Ansible Engineering, did uh, networking, CSD, cloud stuff, uh, then moved on to OpenShift Engineering and doing networking. Um, then I moved on to the office to do some Docker stuff and back to my mothership. And simple, uh, and I'm very happy about it. So I've shuffled around quite a bit. So uh, first, a uh, super brief uh, introduction to Kubernetes. I assume that you know you know what it is, but you know just mandatory slide. So what's Kubernetes? It's an open source platform that was orchestrates containerized applications. So you have your containerized applications, and you declaratively uh, put a manifest. I want to run this uh, application with this many replicas, and I want to expose this port, and you know. Kubernetes does its magic and you know make sure that uh, they get run and, and all the things. Developed by Google, now a CNCF project, so we have a lot of uh, contributors, Red Hat included. Uh, we have a lot of people working on it, um, especially because we have the OpenShift uh, uh, product, which is um, a Kubernetes distribution. There's a wide ecosystem of tools and projects around it. If you go through the CNCF landscape, you will see this uh, massive you know, picture of uh, observability, monitoring, provisioning, all sorts of uh, different use cases that are around Kubernetes, uh, so it's a big thing. Uh, you can either run it on-prem or host it in clouds. You have uh, Kubernetes in AWS, Azure, Google, Lino. Uh, we have Red Hat um, OpenShift in all those clouds. You can also run it on-prem. At its core, Kubernetes, it allows you to self-heal your applications, so make sure that you know it will be always running. If for whatever reason it dies, you know, it will bring it back up. It allows you to do scaling, horizontal scaling, and it also allows you to do rolling updates. So if you uh, update your application, it will do zero downtown update, and you can also do like a rollback. So when you adopt Kubernetes, um, they're typically like a, what they call, I'm not an architect, but you know, it's like a um, known term or you know pattern. It's like they call it like in, in day phases. So Typically in Kubernetes day zero, you gather the requirements for your the workloads that you're going to run in Kubernetes. Um, uh, how are they going to run? Um, whether you know where is it going to be your data? Is it going to be on prem? Is, can it be on cloud? Uh, will you be uh, having like um, hybrid cloud um, Kubernetes, like on prem and on cloud? How you're going to connect that to your environment? So in this um, phase, you do all that. You know. Requirements gathering, the design, and the architecture. Once you have that, then you move on to the next day, um, which is the installing the cluster. So you install the cluster, so you probably have uh, some Ansible playbooks or Terraform or CloudFormation or, I don't know, ARM templates, whatever you know you're running uh, and installing your cluster. You install it, and then you configure it. You put uh, the initial users, you probably hook it up to your infrastructure's code um, repositories with your CSD, and that's uh, the initial bootstrapping of the environment, so to speak. And then in day two, that's where you um, you deploy the workloads, and then you, you do the ongoing maintenance of the whole applications and the underlying infrastructure. So this is where, you know, you take care uh, about observability, so you monitor your applications, you monitor your infrastructure. Is it uh, sane? Is it like uh, maybe, uh, is it um, performing well, not, um, that kind of thing. Then you take care about the scaling. Maybe you, your workloads uh, grow over time and you need to scale the nodes, so that's something that you have to do in day two, so how are you going to do that, all right? Security, um, you know, um, there are back, new users coming in, uh, users coming out, maybe contractors how you're going to handle certificate management, secret rotation, that kind of thing, is what you do. Uh, storage, 
Same thing, so probably you know you will run out of space at some point. If you're on cloud, maybe it's taken care for you by the underlying cloud provider, but maybe you're on-prem, so you need to, how can you expand the storage so you can you know, still run your business applications? Networking, imagine that you, know, you have like a CIDR, an initial CIDR for your cluster, and then you run out of IPs. How can you expand that? Or how you, maybe you need to interconnect to some other internal site? That's uh, uh, another thing uh, you do in, in this area. Update management, both from the application point of view and the cluster. Inevitably, Kubernetes is like a um, um, fast-paced um, uh, project, so new uh, versions come, um, come out, and you may want to keep up and, and update them. Disaster recovery, backup of restore of uh, you know, its CD, um, you know, volumes, um, databases of the applications. Uh, do you have a strategy for that? How can you pack up? How can you restore in case of a total disaster? How can you bring up a mirror uh, cluster environment? Or maybe you have a pilot light um, environment there, and when there's a recovery, you can quickly bring it up. That's the kind of thing that you do. So um, in Kubernetes Day 2, you have tools and practices for doing that. Typically, for within workloads of Kubernetes, you use Kubernetes operators. So um, they're like uh, Kubernetes native applications that um, contain the operational knowledge to um, maintain the life cycle, manage the life cycle of applications. So typically, if you have a password SQL that you use in your environment, you have a password SQL operator that will do the installation, but will also take care of the backups, restore, uh, upgrades, that kind of thing. Uh, you probably want to use GitOps to manage and deploy application infrastructure, so uh, keep and get. Um, declaratively the configuration for both your underlying infrastructure and your applications and have that system to automatically apply the application so no human intervention hopefully and when you done for the things that you know don't fall into the two previous buckets you probably have like run books that define day two processes so best case scenario you probably have like Ansible or bash scripts to automate that okay scenario you will probably have a gdoc or some wiki space somewhere. Worst case scenario, you hit an issue and uh, you you just you know try to figure out and do and fix it. So now I'm going to talk about Ansible. I assume that you know you probably know Ansible, but I don't like to presume things. Um, I will be quick. So Ansible is an IP automation tool. It allows you to automate tasks in your infrastructure. Uh, it's open source. Uh, that's what we do at Red Hat. Uh, it came uh, via an acquisition. Um, it's very easy to learn and use. It uses YAML. Um, the learning curve is really, really easy. You can get going, you know, uh, fairly quick and automate things. It's agentless, meaning that for the things that you want to automate, be servers, network devices, firewalls, um, I don't know, uh, cloud endpoints, you don't have to install anything on the target. You run your automation from a bastion control machine and you perform the automation against those targets. Highly sensible with plugins, everything is a plugin in Ansible, so it's a very you know, extend, uh, extensible system and you can swap in, swap out you know, behavior by changing plugins. Uh, use cases, configuration management, so um, create users, um, install packages, um, you know, system D services, uh, power rules, that kind of thing, and servers. Uh, for circuit provisioning, so we have modules for provisioning pretty much everything, like for AWS, uh, Google, GKE, Azure, VMware, OpenStack. Um, there's also stuff for bare metal provisioning. Application deployment, you can use Ansible to deploy containerized applications or legacy um, RPM applications or dev even. Uh, orchestration, this is my favorite. Since Ansible is so easy to learn and it has such a wide integration with um, Pretty much, you know, every system you can find in, in an IT environment, you can use it as a glue, as a universal uh, automation language to orchestrate all that. <coughs> I recall, as we said, if you have uh, public cloud stuff and on-prem, you can just use it, you know, to uh, interconnect them. Uh, networking, this is a big one. So Ansible has a wide variety of uh, um, modules for managing networking devices. As a matter of fact, we have like a content team just for that. So the Cisco's, the Aristas, the Junipers, you can manage that. 
Same for security, we have modules for Palo Alto, um, uh, Checkpoint, um, um, CM uh, systems, IDS, that kind of thing. We're also getting a lot into Edge. There have been like a, a quite a bit of talks this week about Edge automation, so we are getting into that area a lot. So how it really works. So you have a control machine, which is a bastion, which is where you install Ansible, and that's where you run Ansible from. And then you have your target nodes, which is your servers that you want to automate, or maybe your network devices, or your security appliances, or your cloud endpoints. Um, then in the inventory is where you keep your authentication and connection details on how to connect to those target nodes. And then the playbook, which is the artifact in which you define the things that you want to automate. Typical and, um, inventory static file, uh, very easy to, to read. Uh, here we have a databases group with that IP and a web service group with two IPs, meaning that if I run a playbook against the databases group, it will run the task against that IP. Run against, uh, automation against web service, it will run uh, the task against those two IPs. Uh, fairly simple. This is um, a, a playbook example. Uh, here uh, we have the host, so we're targeting the web service group from the previous inventory file. Uh, we're telling, hey, we want to use like root to get into those machines. And the task which contains the, the automation um, itself. So it's going to run uh, sequentially this task. So in this case, as you can see, you know, it's fairly simple. It, it will install the HTTPD package with yum to the latest version. Then it will templatize with, Gen with Jinja the, the config file. So Ansible, so that's like, you know, from a generic point of view, so then, you know, if you drill down, uh, you have like other components or other um, abstractions. So the modules contain the code to perform a particular task. So uh, there will be a module for uh, typically a Python for containing the, the business logic for this task, for this task, for each one of the tasks, you will have like a module for doing the thing. They're mostly written in Python, but any language can be used, providing that a module, um, a module really just need to like read JSON and output JSON. I mean, how it does it, uh, you know, internally, it's not really, you know, important. I've seen, you know, modules done in Bash, even in Golang, so um, they're easy to develop and ship. So you don't have to like to have a module in your system libraries for Ansible or, you know, push a PR and hopefully, you know, it gets merged and then, you know, it's in a release. You can develop a module, uh, put it into a library folder alongside your playbook, and Ansible will auto detect it and use it. So, which is nice because it allows you to get going and also test modules uh, easily. So, Ansible has built in modules. So, whenever you see ansible.builtin. whatever, so those are built in modules. So, they're um, part of the Ansible core package. So. It's something that you get, you know, bundled, bundled and built in with that uh, RPM package. There are also Ansible content team modules. So we have content team uh, within Ansible for uh, networking, uh, cloud, also security thing, and also people doing edge stuff right now. We also have uh, partners doing modules. So um, some other like, uh, I don't know, vendors from all kind, uh, they also have like their, their modules and they, they, plug, they develop and maintain them. And you also have community modules. You know, uh, we have a great and vibrant community, and we get uh, a lot of contributions there. So, once you start, you know, doing a um, lot of your playbooks, you will uh, start realizing that you know um, um, you can maybe refactor and reuse that automation for other environments, not necessarily tying that to a specific. Uh, host of your inventory. So that's when you use roles. So roles allows you to encapsulate. Ansible contents such as tasks, change of templates, um, static files variables um, to automate a, a particular thing. So you typically would have a, like a role for, I don't know, Nginx, for Apache, for PostgreSQL, and that's um, uh, self-contained and can be reused in whatever environment that you have. Uh, there, uh, once you have a role created, uh, the way you use it then it's you include it or import it in a playbook as a task. So you would do include role, my role, and it would include it and run the task uh, within your play. So that's the typical structure of a role. Here we have a common role which contains a task folder, a main YAML, 
um, some danger templates, static files, uh, some bars that they're specific to the role, and some defaults in case you don't have, uh, you don't specify the bars on command line or in the playbook. There are some other things, uh, but these are like, you know, the most common ones. You also have like handlers and some other things. You can also, you used to be able to ship plugins, uh, um, but now, you know, with collections, which we'll see in a moment, uh, that's not anymore, you know, a thing for roles. So plugins, as we said, you know, extend and modify for Ansible capabilities. Um, there, there, are, there is like a large variety of plugins. Uh, you have connection plugins, so typically you, when you use Linux and you run all your automation against Linux, it's going to use the SSH connection plugin, but maybe you have Windows machines. So Windows is not usually, uh, SSH is not something that you usually use in Windows, so there's a WinRM connection plugin. For networking devices, there, there are like NetConf uh, connection plugins. So it really uh, allows you to extend and you know to adapt to different kind of um, devices and, and, and things that you may use in, in Ansible. They're easy to develop uh, by using Python. These ones, uh, you have to use Python. I don't think you can use uh, other language. Um, okay, so now you have playbooks, you have plugins, you have roles. So how can you package that up? So uh, back in the day when I joined, so we had Ansible Ansible. And um, we shipped all the modules, all the plugins and everything within one repo. Then that became, you know, hard to maintain and hard to contribute because, uh, you know, um, we only had, you know, certain bandwidth to review and get things going. So there was a decision to decouple. So I have Ansible Core, as I, I talked about earlier, to just contain the, the core of Ansible, the, the binary and the built-in modules, and then the rest have it uh, in a separate artifact, which is called a collection. So we're happy in collection contain playbook roles, modules and plugins. Uh, so they're typically like um, uh, for a domain automation, so you will have a collection for AWS, collection for Azure, I don't know, uh, for um, Arista, you know, and those collections will contain all Ansible things for automating that particular domain. Distributed by uh, Ansible Galaxy and Private Hub, uh, you can just uh, go to Ansible Galaxy, it's like uh, the, the content store for Ansible. You can just go to browse for content and download it and install it in your machine. You can also have like a private Galaxy, which is called a private hub, to install that. So for Kubernetes, it's no exception. So there's a collection for Kubernetes, which is called Kubernetes Core Collection. It contains modules and plugins for automating Kubernetes and OpenShift, since OpenShift is Kubernetes. Uh, you install it via Galaxy. Um, you Ansible Galaxy Election install, Kubernetes Core, you install it in your machine, and then you can uh, use that company. So this is a subset of modules that are um, um, included in the collection. So you will have modules for Helm. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It's like an RPM kind of thing. Um, it uses something that they call a chart which is like a definition for an application. So you can just, instead of using help, you can just use this module. It will use it under the covers. Then we have uh, modules for managing Kubernetes objects. See, this is probably the, the, um, the most used one, the Kates module, because it allows you to either slap into the module as parameter the definition for an object, or you can also specify a Kubernetes manifest that you may have, meaning you don't have to redo your Kubernetes manifest in the Ansible DSL. You can just reuse your Kubernetes manifest and just use it. Uh, you can exec into pods, get information about uh, Kubernetes objects, log pods. You also have imperative modules like uh, rollback and scale, not only declarative. Some other specialized like service modules, which are probably not super useful because you can do the same thing with the case module. This is an example, so here, um, we're using a, a, a Kubernetes manifest that is within testing, the pro, um, deployment YAML. This is a Kubernetes manifest, and we're telling, hey, apply this manifest, and we just do it. That's why I said that you know it's good, because you don't have to use the Ansible DSL, you can just reuse your Kubernetes manifest. You don't have to change anything in your um, environment. Here, another example, using an imperative module. So here we're saying, hey, uh, the Elastic deployment, which is under namespace my project, I want it to be three replicas, and it will 
do that uh, keto apply to have that replica set. Okay, so what's CDA? So it's a new Ansible project that allows you to execute automation based off of threads. So, um, what it is? It allow, uh, typically in Ansible, okay, you have a playbook and you know you want to perform something. I don't know, maybe you you want to do a backup and there's a, a human running a playbook or something happens and something opens you a ticket. Hey, I need to do a restore. Then you run the restore playbook. So what EDA allows you is to automate that trigger of that Ansible automation. You can think of it as a, the if this, then that of Ansible. Um, so basically, you with EDA, um, what you do is you observe events from your environment. <coughs> then when those events trigger, you evaluate those events against some rules, which you define. And then, you know, if there's a match, then you run some action. So, EDA uses um, a, um, an abstraction or a concept that is called a rule book. You probably, hey, yeah, it's like a playbook. Yeah, so it's a rule book. It's the playbooks for EDA. So rule probably gives you a hint what they're all about. So rule books contain a, a set of uniquely named rule sets. Uh, then within rule sets, you have a host section, which you, know, you define uh, what you want to target for your automation. The sources you want to listen. So what kind of... Um, the, the events you want to, to uh, react to, and the, re the rules to evaluate those events. Then the rules themselves contain conditions and actions, so, and then if the events match the conditions, if there's a match, there's an evaluation that is performed by the Jules engine, it's a Java-based um, uh, en engine for, uh, for rules, uh, then the rule action is executed. You know, rather than me uh, trying to explain Things abstract. Let's see a rule book. So here we have a rule book called Hello Events. It contains a host section, in this case local host, and has a sources section, which this is where you put your event sources uh, plugins. So here it's Ansible EDA range, which I'll go through it you know, in a moment. Then you have the rules, which have this one rule called uh, say hello with a condition and an action. So in this case, the event source plugin in Ansible EDA range is kind of a test event source plugin, which basically does a Python range. So it will go from zero to five and will, it will create an event for each value. So there will uh, be an event for zero, for one, for two, for three. Then as a rule, we want to catch when the event.i, the key i within the event is one. And when there's a match, we will then run this playback. It's probably not super, you know, fancy, but probably uh, in this uh, next thing you will probably see, you know, what we can accomplish with EDA. So in this case, we have another rulebook. Check my web app. We're targeting all the machines on our inventory, and um, we're using the URL check event source plugin. What it does is will pull for the URLs that we have as a parameter. Continuously, you can, uh, you can put that uh, delay or timeout value for when you want to do that check, and it will return back the status code 200, 400, 500, whatever. So, here in the rule, it's called help, and we have in the condition hey, uh, trigger it when the status code is different to 200, and then run a playbook which is called restart app. So, basically, we have a, this is a rule book for self healing, remediating a web app. So this is the kind of thing that we, we can do with EDA. So in the rule sections, as you can see, we can have, have like multiple rules, not just one, it's like a list. Within each rule, you can have like multiple conditions. You can have like uh, checking various things within the event, so different fields, uh, compare against different values. Uh, each rule can have like multiple actions. So when there's a match for a given rule, you can have like a list of actions and they will be executed uh, ex um, sequentially. Although I think they put a patch uh, recently which you can have like run uh, actions in parallel. Uh, I need to get back uh, to it and check. So the rule conditions is like a, you know, um, a Python Boolean expression. Uh, it, it allows to put like Boolean operators, arithmetic operation and is, so you can do things 
does my event contain this key or is this key within my event equals to this value, greater than, less than, that kind of thing. You have and or not, you know, the usual that you would expect for that kind of uh, expression. It can contain multiple conditions. You can have like a list of conditions and you can also use like any all operators to say, okay, uh, if there's any of the condition matching the event, then execute the action or whether you want to have like all of them to match in order to get down to the action. So the final part of the um, actions are like in the final part of the event workflow. So that we have event, we have the evaluation of the rule for the event, and then if there's a match, the, that's the action. So that's like the, the final part. The define the execution part when the event is matched by a rule. So when there's a match, then you run the action. Uh, you have like a built-in set of actions bundled with EDA. Um, event source plugins, um, they're like a separate from the EDA um, core. Um, um, actions are like bundled within the binary that EDA uses. Um, there, are no, there are no plugins right now for actions, but I think they're open to also open to, to bundle actions as part of a separate content. So probably will be implemented down the line. These are like the actions that you get built in from EDA. You can run a playbook, as we saw in the examples. We can run a module. This is like the same uh, when you do Ansible all-mping. Imagine that you want to do like a quick execution with Ansible. You, you don't want to create a playbook for just one task, and you want to specify the module and the parameters in a one-liner. That's what you can use with one module. Run job template, so maybe you have AWX automation controller somewhere containing your inventories, your job templates, and all your automation, you can hit that controller, AWX, and run automation from it. You can create facts just in, like in Ansible uh, post events. So maybe you want to have like a, a flow of different um, uh, um, events, uh, like a, in a flow chart. Um, so you hit an event, and then you want to jump into another event. So that's something that you can do with post event. Uh, you can also retract paths, you know, uh, from the rulebook execution, uh, pull it out, uh, print events, which is just for debugging, and shutdown, which I think is for restarting rulebook if something goes wrong, or uh, you want to restart it for whatever reason. So we saw event source plugins, they contain the business logic for the sources, so for the URL check, there will be a Python thing for doing that. For the EDA range, there will be a Python thing for doing that, and for more interesting things, which we'll see in the next slide. They are Python files. Uh, they use the async IO library, so they are asynchronous. The plugins can be either uh, polling for external sources, or it, they can also be listening in a port. So an external source can send events to the plugin, and then you know it reacts. Once uh, you know, it catches the event, it puts it into a queue that the, the EDA uh, runtime gives it to the plugin, and then you know, it can um, evaluate it with the rules engine, and then uh, depending if there's a match or not, uh, run the action. So how does it really look from internally a uh, plugin? So this is like you know, the, the meat of the um, URL check event source plugin. I'm not an SAKIO guy. Uh, I mean, I've got it in Python uh, Iowa, but it's not hard to read. It's an infinite loop in which it gets a, a, a session with AIHTTP, a client, and then it, it tries to, for each one of the URL that you pass as a parameter, it will try to hit it. And it's gonna get the status, and then it's going to put it into the queue as a deck. So then it can get evaluated by the rules engine. So what are the events for plugins? Uh, oh yeah, so right now we have like the um, um, one official one that uh, we, we the EDA um, team maintains and develops, which is the Ansible EDA collection. They, they have like a bunch of different plugins. These are like the, the most, uh, it's just a subset. So you have like event source plugins for Kafka, so you can actually get events from a Kafka queue. Uh, also from Alert Manager, which is a companion service for Prometheus. Um, Prometheus getting metrics, then Alert Manager alerting when the metrics go over or below a threshold, and then you can get, you can trigger 
automation from alert management. CloudTrail, the, the, one of the um, services for AWS for security that you know, keeps a, a log of the API calls for a given account. Um, SQS is like a messaging system. Um, it's also very, very handy. Uh, Azure Service Bus, same thing. Um, Web, Webhook, uh, this is a good one because it's a, a generic Webhook. Event source flagging, this is like a listen event source flagging, so it's going to listen in a port, and you're going to have external systems send webhooks to the port and then react to those events. So, uh, along the, uh, the Ansible EDA collection, so we're getting partners developing their own Ansible EDA collection, so th those are some things that have been um, announced. So CrowdStrike, a security vendor, they are developing their, their own for uh, the product Cisco for the NXOS um, devices lines and the Thousand Ice Kit, which I think is like a monitoring product line. Dynatrace, uh, an APM. Uh, IBM Instana, another APM. Turbonomic, I think it's a cost management system. Uh, Palo Alto, you know, security vendor. F5 networking security vendor. Zabbix, monitoring solutions. So they're developing their own ADA plugins. So then, uh, um, you can also, uh, you will be able to integrate if you're using it in your environments to integrate with that. Besides event source flagging, you, uh, you have event filters, which allow you to filter data from events. So at times the event from the plugin can be, you know, really big and there may be information that you're not interested. So they allow you to remove or transform the, the events. Uh, you can chain um, the event filters Imagine a Linux pipe um, operator, so you can chain them. And they define after the source definition, they like a per source, um, you know, uh, object. Um, built in, you have a JSON filter, event filter, so it, uh, it allows you to include or exclude keys from a JSON. Convert dashes to underscore to maybe, because maybe you, know, you, you need like a snake case. Uh, insert host to meta if you want to search some host of, as part of your rule activation to the event, uh, normal skis. Um, this is some, also something that you can ha um, develop, um, like event source plugins, and, and bundle into your um, EDA uh, content. Uh, speaking about just, uh, EDA content, how it gets distributed. So EDA content is going to leverage Ansible collections, framework, and tooling. So meaning, you're going to have like an, uh, Ansible EDA Roblox and event source plugins and event filters using the collections framework. So you'll be able to just use Ansible as a collection install to, and you put your collection, it will install it. You can, you can also publish it with, uh, with this thing and it will be able to publish into Galaxy um, just like a, an Ansible collection. So as we said, the Ansible EDA is the first EDA collection available. It's the, the one that, you know, uh, bootstrap the project. Now, let's go dig deeper. So how we, what are the components? So the, the main component right now for EDA is called Ansible Robot. It is the CLI and worker component for event-driven Ansible. You can either run it in a standalone mode, so you can run Ansible Robot. You provide an inventory, your rulebook file, and it will run in the foreground. Or you can also run it in worker mode, provide an ID and a WebSocket endpoint, so it can connect to a WebSocket and to get, you know, uh, what, what will book should I be, you know, um, using? This is what, what's going to use largely for the EDA controller server uh, offering. So we're, mm, the EDA team is working on the same way we, with Ansible, we have the automation controller, which is a central console containing your automation for Ansible. There's going to be an EDA server containing your role books. Uh, you can log in, uh, log out, you can, you will get, uh, you know, logging about your events and it's a web application, so to speak. So the worker mode is what gets used. Uh, so robot connecting to that system. So how we can, so we've gone through Kubernetes, uh, Ansible, Ansible, Kubernetes content, EDA. How can we mesh EDA with Kubernetes for the web base? So Kubernetes clusters can emit events for changes. So the API server is constantly, you know, um, every single component in the Kubernetes system is hitting the API server. It's the, the one that is responsible for performing change in your cluster. So when you create a CR, deployment, and config man namespace, 
uh, you know, um, you get to create things, it can update the product operations, right? Now, the cool thing about Kubernetes API is it allows you to put, uh, what they call it a watch. So a watch is a, um, like um, an API call you can put for a given resource version. So you can basically say, hey, I want to put a watch for config map objects under this namespace. And then the Kubernetes API is going to stream me back uh, any kind of config map changes in, in that namespace, whether there are new ones, config maps are updated or they're deleted. Um, I'm going to get those events. So, given that kind of functionality, that's what we need an event source plugin for. We need to plug into that um, capability from Kubernetes for getting watches. So, get events from the API and then so we can react to them. So, there's an event source plugin for Kubernetes. It's called Saber 1041.dda. It's a collection that was written by Andrew Block. It's uh, another uh, fellow Red Hat. I think he's around. Uh, I haven't met him. If you're interested, um, you know, try to reach him. He, he wrote it. Um, as a matter of fact, he also like uh, published a blog post about the EDA collection, how it gets used. So how it works, it, it uses Kubernetes libraries, the event source plugin. So you, with, the, with this event source plugin, you define which resource you want to watch. Uh, I don't know, maybe API version v1, config map, namespace foo. And then it, it, it connects to the Kubernetes cluster and, and, get, and puts a watch against that. And then the plugin gets uh, events from um, that watch. So that's one way of using of uh, getting events from Kubernetes, or you can use the generic webhook, which is it's already bundled within Ansible IDA. The webhook plugin is a generic event source plugin that receives webhook events. So it's an event source plugin that listens on a port, and uh, you can get si external systems sending webhooks to that port, and then you know that's the the plugin will get the events. Uh, in that way. So as you can imagine, so we, we're gonna need to have something because Kubernetes cannot just do it that uh, itself. We need to have something to do that watch mechanism for whatever resources we're interested in and send those events as webhooks to our plugin. So this is what we can use. Uh, Robusta Dev Cube Watch is a tool that was developed by uh, Bitnami. Um, it's a CLI tool which basically you create a config file and you say, hey, I want to get the watches for deployments, config maps, uh, nodes, whatever. Um, and then for those events, send webhooks to this endpoint. So what we can do, we can have KubeWatch running, hooked up to our cluster, sending webhooks to our event source plugin, running webhook and therefore. So now we're going to do a demo. I don't know if is this going to be a hard one? Because I don't have a mirroring. I'll try my best. <coughs> so. Can you increase the uh, yes. font size? Yeah. Is it good? That's better. So here, this is my laptop. So I have a cube config. So it's. I, mean, I, I have a cluster, okay, and I can just run kubectl commands. So here I have kubewatch with uh, some, with a config file, which is kubewatch.yaml. As you can see, it's a YAML file which you specify the webhook section. Okay, so for the events, the watches that I put against my cluster, where I want to send uh, those webhooks. So I'm sending to my machine um, four or five thousand, which I'm going to have my event source plugin listening for that. And then for resources, I can put the kind of resources that I want to put a watch. So in this case, uh, we're, we want to uh, put watches for deployments, uh, config maps, nodes, and I think uh, namespaces. Okay? So if we run it, it it's you know on the foreground and it's it puts a, a watch for those resources against my cluster so whenever there's something uh happening for those resources in my cluster it will pick it up and send to a webhook so if we 
as an example. So if I create the namespace, Ricky test. Okay. And if I go back to the cube watch, it got, oh, processing that to namespace Ricky test. So it got that event and it tried to send to 5000, but there's nothing, you know, listening. So what we want, that's because I don't have the event source plugin rulebook, um, you know, this Ansible rulebook with the event source plugin uh, for Webhook and that for listening yet. So let's do some, uh, some cool demo. Let's see, let's imagine that uh, we have users using our clusters, doing deployments, whatever. And there's a certain image and tag version for that. Uh, there's a CVE or for whatever reason, we don't want any users to deploy it in our cluster. So what we want, we want to catch whether there's any kind of deployment using that into, in this example, the uh, default namespace. We want to catch that. Uh, if, if it's using the body image, we want to scale it back to zero so it doesn't run on our cluster, and we want to notify to some Slack that I have um, and post a message, hey, someone tried to do this, don't do, don't do it, okay? So if I go here, I'm going to show you So this is real world book. So using the webhook event source plugin, listening on four five thousand, and we have one rule, which is uh, name and scale down by the image deployment. What are the conditions? So get events that the kind is a deployment, and whether you know the reason for the event is created. So basically, we want to get kubeket create deployment. Now the thing is that. The event itself doesn't give us the information about the image being used, so we will need to do some introspection based on the name of the deployment. And that's something that we will do as part of the playbook. So when the condition is met, we're going to run this playbook, scale down by the image deployment and notify, and we pass some bars, my Slack token, the deployment name, which comes from the event, so we can do that introspection within the playbook, and my uh, Kubernetes API token so I can do the scale down, okay? If we look, the playbook that corresponds to this rulebook, so here we have some var, uh, it's called bad, bad image, which is Nginx 1.14.2. So that's the bad image that we want to detect. So if there's a deployment using that image, we want to scale it down, notify, okay? So what the playbook does, by leveraging the Kubernetes modules, um, this is why, you know, Ansible is so powerful, because it can integrate with everything, and it's really uh, um, a great, great glue for your automation. We can, uh, we're going to introspect the deployment, and we're going to register into the deployment variable. Then, I have a block, so a block is, you can group task for a given uh, um, condition or um, yeah, a variable expression. So meaning, when the deployment that we get earlier, uh, if we drill down into the JSON, because that's a JSON, so this gives us the deployment object, okay? So we will introspect it, so we'll get into the pod template of the deployment, we will check for the container whether you know it's using the bad image. And if it's the same, then we run the task within the block. And the task within the block is using the case scale module. So, uh, you know, set the replicas to zero, and then notify to Slack that, hey, you know, someone is using the bad image, so I have to scale down the deployment, please do not use it. So. If I run the rulebook, which is this one. So now I have rulebook, 
listen on port 5000. I have Cube Watch, so getting events from Kubernetes and for whatever events it's configured to, it will send to port 5000, which is where we have ED, um, EDA listening on. So if we go to another session, here I have a deployment manifest, okay? It creates an Nginx deployment, three replicas, and it uses the bad image, Nginx 114.2. So we want to catch that. So if I apply, as you can see, Roadbug got triggered and it's running a playbook. So if I switch back quickly and I do an OC get deployment, oh, it was quick enough. So it created a deployment, three replicas, but we catch that event and we scale it back down to zero. So we were able to remediate the thing in our crash that you know we care about and we don't want to happen. And if we go back to here, Hopefully I can see the... So this is my Slack. Yeah, so it's 10, 16, right? So maybe, let me... So we got the Slack notification on our Slack about what happened, and we scale it down. So I hope that you can see, you know, how we can leverage all this, because we can build that by using all the integration that we have with Ansible, we can react to events from our environment, whether it's at the in-cluster level or at the underlying infrastructure where our cluster runs, and we can, do, we can run automation for it. And that's the end of the talk. That's uh, what I have. Any questions? Anything that is not clear? Okay, I was on the light speed talk yesterday. Can I create a light speed event? Yes, as a matter of fact, I know. Could you oh. repeat the question? Yeah, so um, someone asked, uh, Radek asked in the audience if there's a way to integrate light speed, uh, which is a, an AI assistant for um, writing playbooks uh, in VS Code and you know assist you for writing automation to integrate with that. For sure, because Lightspeed has an API, so you could create an event source plugin or some automation, uh, you know, and plug it. As a matter of fact, I know that there's some people within my team that they're looking into integrations of Lightspeed at EDA, because, uh, you know, if you can get, you know, suggestions about how to remediate, imagine, you get an error in your cluster and you, you have no run book or automation for it. If you could hit Lightspeed API and get uh, suggestion for a playbook to remediate that, that becomes extremely powerful, right? So that's a great question. Are there any plans uh, to get EDA into AAP? Oh, there is. As a matter of fact, so my team uh, is, um, no, not my team. Uh, so my team, we've been developing an operator for an EDA controller offering. So the same way you have AWX or automation controller for Ansible, Ansible, um, you know, it's just the the, uh, the single tool for running playbooks, but you have AWS Automation Control as a central console for running your automation. There's going to be a product EDA server or controller, which is the same thing for EDA. So you will have a central console, which you can have users logging in, logging out. You will be able to uh, create, um, upload your rulebooks, uh, see your activations, uh, you know, your event data, that kind of thing. Um, I want to also say it's a rather novel and you know young project. We would love, we'd love, love to get contributions and people you know um, involved in the project. Especially as you can see, the answer with the A, yes, in case event source plugins, but you know, you know, the sky's the limit, right? Um, um, ideally, you know, we would like to have. It would be nice to have event source plugins for integrating with whatever you have in a typical IT environment. Whatever cloud, whatever SaaS you use, whatever, whatever. 
So uh, if you want to contribute, by all means, I mean, uh, uh, the DA team will be happy to look at your PRs and, uh, you know, contribute with them. And as a matter of fact, we, we've already got some contributions. There was another talk the other day, uh, uh, Cube Alex, I think is the guy, he, he contributed an MQTT plugin, uh, which is uh, really nice. And, you know, if you want to be involved, you know, we'd be happy to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. We don't have any questions from metrics, so that concludes this session. Thank you very much.